Okay, folks, welcome to the lecture on forebrain and the cortex. The material we need to cover in these slides, the structure and function of the main areas of the cortex and the forebrain, and we need to discuss the sensory systems, the visual, auditory, language and feeding systems that take part in this part of the brain. If you take a slice through the frontal lobes, you'll identify two structures called the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The telencephalon is a paired lateral structure which forms the cerebral or neocortex and forms the top of this dissection with a ventricle in the middle. The diencephalon is a midline ventral structure. If you look on the third diagram, you can see how it's separated by function. So the thalamus is the side walls of the structure, which forms a large tube. The hypothalamus is the floor, and the epithalamus, which will form the pineal gland, forms down from the roof. The pineal gland, or the pineal organ, as it's known in some places, it differs in function between various species. So in fish, amphibians and reptiles, it contains photoreceptors. In birds and mammals, it secretes melatonin. So it influences our circadian and seasonal rhythms. Although it's not itself a biological clock, it does influence the breeding seasons. If you look at the diagram on the left, you'll see a fish, frog, bird, and human brains going down. This is useful for you to actually see how as the animals have become more developed and more differentiated, the brain structure has changed. So in A with the fish, the medulla is out the back, then have the cerebellum at the top, the optic globe in yellow, and the cerebrum shown in purple. The pituitary gland is a small blue gland underneath. As you move up through the frog, you can see that various parts of the brain are changing shape. By the time you're at the bird, you can see the cerebellum has become quite large, the cerebrum is also large, and you can see the pineal organs, labelled here as the epiphysis, sticking out between the two. At this point, the midbrain structures and the medulla are being pushed underneath the brain. By the time you get to the human, you can see how the forebrain has actually formed around in this convoluted structure to form the two cerebral hemispheres, Cerebellum is at the back, the medulla and the pons have been pushed underneath the structures themselves. The cortex is the layer of grey matter which covers the entire cerebral hemispheres. It's a very highly convoluted structure and that reflects the differentiation and the amount of intelligence of the various species. It's between 2 and 4 millimetres thick and has six layers. During development, cells migrate out from the centre of the neural tube and locate in these different layers. This process is highly regulated to make sure that synapses occur in the right places and that each layer has been defined and made correctly. The sensory fibres, for example, reach the cortex, make their first synapse in layer 4. The thalamus is a key part of the brain and acts as the gateway to the cortex. All senses enter the cortex via the thalamus and descending motor axons pass through it on the way down the spinal cord to the effector organs. You may see the thalamus called other names, such as the lateral geniculate nucleus or lateral geniculate body. For the purpose of this lecture, we'll stick with thalamus or the LGN. If you take a brain and actually slice straight through the forebrain, first thing you'll see are the two hemispheres are separated. They're both derived from the telencephalon and they're connected only by the corpus callosum, which is a large bunch of nerve fibres in the middle, and the anterior commissure. Women tend to have a larger corpus callosum than men and have the ability to use both hemispheres at the same time. Men, on the other hand, have a smaller corpus callosum and tend to think with either one hemisphere or the other at any one time. That allows them to focus specifically on a task in hand, whereas traditionally women are termed to be multitaskers because they can use both hemispheres. If you look at the false colour diagram, the first thing you'll note is that the frontal lobe is probably the largest of the lobes of the brain, it's shown here in blue. It's separated from the parietal lobe shown in green by the central sulcus, which is a large fissure going between the lobes. The back of the brain is the occipital lobe shown in pink, and the temporal lobe is shown in beige. The temporal lobe is where the auditory centres lie, and the occipital lobe is where the visual centres lie. It's not possible just by looking at the brain to identify where functions lie, but it is possible due to functional mapping. Each sense has its own primary area for processing. So we've got the primary motor cortex and the somatic sensory cortex identified on the brain, either side of the central sulcus. The visual processing area lies in the occipital lobe and the auditory lies in the temporal lobe. 
process of taking a somatosensory cortex and identifying which part of the cortex relates to which part of the body is called topographical mapping. In this case, the body surface is mapped onto the contralateral post-central gyrus of the brain, so the somatosensory cortex. Sensitive areas of the body take up the majority of the cortical space, for example, the face, the hands and the lips. There is limited cortical plasticity, however, so if a limb, for example, is lost, that part of the cortex will reassign to another part of the body so that you've not lost that functionality, although you have lost the limb. If we take all this together and we put it into human format, the proportions of the body relating to the proportions of the cortex, you create something called a homunculus. In this case, you're identifying where the maximum sensory cortex is relating, so face, lips, tongue and hands. We're going to start working through some of the senses now. So on the visual system, see where the eyes are. They lie directly underneath the frontal lobes. The optic nerves come down and they form an optic chasm where they actually cross over. This is called partial decussion. And as a result, it's because the right visual hemifield projects to the left part of the brain and vice versa, which is why if you cover one eye and then cover the other, you'll see different parts of your visual field. Cells in the right side of each retina see the left visual hemisphere and vice versa. If you look at the diagram on the bottom, you show the left visual hemisphere in pink, the right visual hemisphere in blue, and the nerves are coloured to identify which part sees which hemisphere. The fixation point is shown in the middle. So the optic nerve fibres from the right side of each eye go to the right LGN, the thalamus, and the cortex. The primary visual cortex is organised retinotopically. So its formation and its organisation is identical to that of the retina. This is the V1 area or the striate cortex. It is, however, not the only part of the brain that deals with the visual system. In addition to V1, there are a number of other extra striate visual systems in the brain. If you look at the diagram on the right, you can see various different centres identified. I only need to know about V1 for the purpose of this lecture. On the left-hand diagram, you can see V1 and you have a ventral stream and a dorsal stream of information. These different areas, in addition to V1, successively analyse form, colour and movement. The dorsal stream, which tends to go around the parietal areas, deals with the position of objects, whereas the ventral stream, which is the temporal areas, recognise their identity. There are specific areas of the cortex that deal with facial recognition, and there's a rare form of blindness where patients can see but cannot recognise faces. Very rarely, strokes can cause a loss of function in any one of these areas, so it may occur that you lose colour vision or motor perception, however the rest of your vision remains intact because it's only that particular part of the extra striate system that's been affected. Whereas the visual V1 system is retinotopically mapped, the auditory system is tonotopically organised so that each part of the primary auditory cortex responds to a particular frequency. This changes with age, so as you get older, you find the ability to hear high frequencies diminishes, whereas in young people, up to mid-teens, they still have this ability. The primary auditory cortex is shown in purple, and you have a secondary auditory cortex surrounding it, shown in yellow. This cortex is also very important when it comes to language. Moving back from the senses for a moment and just looking at the motor cortex, if we once again look at the motor cortex as we did for the primary sensory cortex and we somatopically map it again to the contralateral side, we have premotor areas and supplementary motor areas which are active during the planning of movement. But when we look at the primary motor cortex itself, again very similar to the somatosensory cortex, you can see that the areas of the cerebrum that are dedicated to certain parts of the body larger depending on how much motor input they have. So again, the face and the hands, large numbers of muscles and a very large amount of motor input required, so that means they take up a larger portion of the cerebellum cortex. If we look at all the areas of the brain that are relating to movement, first we've got prefrontal cortex shown there and we have area 6 which consists of the premotor area and the supplementary motor area which are involved in that planning. M1 is the primary motor cortex, shown in pink, with the central sulcus in the middle, and the sensory somatosensory cortex, shown in green. 
then have areas 5 and 7, which are in the posterior parietal cortex. I mentioned that there are various areas to do with language. Language function is almost always lateralised to the left hemisphere, so in the vast majority of people, that's where you'll find this. The two major areas you need to know about are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Broca's area deals with the motor aspects of speech, so control of the tongue, lips, mouth and throat. And if you look on the brain diagram, you'll see it's very closely related to the motor cortex, specifically the motor control of the mouth and lips. Wernicke's area, on the other hand, is concerned with the production and comprehension of language, and that is located very close to the auditory cortex, as you would expect, because you need the listening and the hearing of the language to be able to comprehend it. One of the reasons why it's important to understand how visual and auditory comprehension occurs is the ability to actually speak out loud. According to the wernicke gershwin model, there are two different pathways for input depending on whether you are repeating a spoken word that you've heard back to the person who's spoken it, or whether you're reading written word to someone else. For example, if you're repeating a spoken word, and this is a classic example of a child learning language, the auditory cortex first of all is activated. That then sends input to Wernicke's area, it passes up through the angular gyrus, through the arcuate fasciculus and into Broca's area. From there it stimulates the motor cortex which controls the muscle, muscles of the mouth and face. That allows you to speak. Children tend to learn to speak before they can learn to read. So they tend to learn how to speak by hearing what their parents say and repeating it. The ability to read and to read out loud is different, and this requires the primary visual cortex to become activated. That then sends synapses to the angular gyrus, which then stimulates the Wernicke's area. That bypasses the auditory cortex, goes straight to Broca's area, and straight to the motor cortex. So the ability to repeat a spoken word requires you to hear it first, process that information, and then process the muscle and motor commands to speak whereas reading a written word requires you to actually use your visual cortex to identify what you're seeing, process the words, identify what they mean in Wernicke's area, then stimulate Broca's area to allow you to speak out loud. Going back to the basic structures of the forebrain and cortex, the hypothalamus is one of the key structures that you must know about. The hypothalamus functions in homeostasis and motivation, so feeding and drinking behaviour, controlling body temperature, sexual behaviour, parental behaviour, aggression and circadian rhythm. The arcuate nucleus is the lowest part of the hypothalamus. It's located at the base of the third ventricle and is involved directly in feeding behaviour. Hypothalamus controls the pituitary and autonomic control and is therefore an endocrine organ. If you look at the diagram of the hypothalamus, you can see that it is split into sections depending on its location in relation to the third ventricle. So the arcuate nucleus is at the bottom. You then come out from the ventricle to the periventricular hypothalamus, medial hypothalamus and lateral hypothalamus as you move further out. Current science believes that there's a two-centre hypothesis for feeding control, with the two centres being the lateral hypothalamus and the ventral medial hypothalamus. We believe that the lateral hypothalamus is our feeding centre, so any lesion in this area impairs feeding. Stimulation induces feeding behaviour such as hunting, gathering, foraging, whereas activity will increase with hunger. In this case, this is the rat in part A at the top where they've got lesions of the lateral hypothalamus. Because there are no longer signalling in that area, that rat is not going to start looking for food and as a result it's got very thin. The ventral medial hypothalamus, we believe, is the safety centre, so signalling through this area informs you that you're full, basically. Lesions here cause hyperphagia, i.e. too much eating. Stimulation of this area inhibits feeding, indicating that you've had enough to eat, you don't need to take any more energy in, and the activity decreases with hunger. In this case, if you look at the rat on the bottom, these are lesions in the ventral medial hypothalamus, the rat has suffered from classic hyperphagia, has eaten far too much, continued to eat, and has put all that extra energy down as adipose tissue, so it's become very fat. 
There are a variety of peripheral signals for long-term energy balance and feeding control. If you look at the diagram first with the CNS at the top, anabolic stimulation reduces the energy expenditure by lowering the metabolic rate and controlling physical activity. It stimulates food intake, which in turn increases energy balance. As the energy balance increases, that triggers the fat stores to be activated and to put any excess energy away as fat, and that stimulates the release of insulin and leptin. These adiposity signals then have a negative feedback loop on anabolic stimuli and a positive feedback loop on catabolic stimuli. By stimulating the catabolic centres, you reduce food intake and increase your metabolic activity and your physical activity. By doing that, you decrease your energy balance and that has a negative feedback loop round on the rest. So you stimulate the fat stores to break down and so on. I mentioned the arcuate nucleus before alongside the hypothalamus. Remember, it's the part of the hypothalamus that drops underneath the third ventricle. We believe that this is the key centre for dealing with feeding behaviour. You have several different nuclei of cells. You have the paraventricular nucleus, or the PVN, at the top. You then have the arcuate nucleus at the bottom. In this case, it's one form of neurone. This is the alpha MSH, or CART neurones and you have the lateral hypothalamic area, or the LHA. What we believe happens is when leptin is high, the arcuate neurons stimulate the PVN and inhibit the LHA. By inhibiting the LHA, you're inhibiting feeding behaviour, and that means you stop eating, you stop looking for food. Same time, stimulation of the PVN stimulates release of ACTH and thyrotropin from the anterior pituitary, and you also have activation both from stimulation of the PVN and the arcuate nucleus to activate brainstem neurons and preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. If, however, leptin is low, different arcuate, nu arcuate nucleus neurons start to fire. These are the NPY AGRP neurons. They inhibit the PVN and stimulate the LHA. By stimulating the lateral hypothalamic area, they're stimulating feeding behaviour. By inhibiting the paraventricular nucleus, they inhibit the secretion of the hyperphysiotropic hormones controlling ACTH and thyroid stimulating hormone. This is an orexigenic effect, so it leads to an increased feeding behaviour as that animal is now under the impression that it has low energy reserves. It needs to eat to replenish those. In humans, there are additional short-term feeding controls. The obvious one is stomach distension. As you eat, you stretch the stomach. As the stomach distends, it signals via the vagus nerve by the nucleus of the solitary tract in the brain. The intestinal cells start producing CCK, which is the hormone cholecystokinin, and you see an increase in rise of insulin released by pancreatic cells. All of these send information through the brain to inform the brain that these are satiety signals and that you have, you've got sufficient energy balance coming in. There's an integration of the long and short term signals here. So first of all, you have the adiposity signals, the fat mass releasing the leptin. That has an effect on the arcuate nucleus. You will either stimulate catabolic or anabolic pathways in response to the satiety signals. Satiety signals come from chemical signals, such as energy metabolism in the liver, CCK release, mechanical signals from distension of the, the stomach, either way sends messages up through either the vagus nerve or the cervical spine afferent tract and that goes straight into the feeding centres at the back of the brain and allows you to control whether it's catabolic pathways or anabolic pathways. I'm not going to continue to discuss any on this slide, it's simply an amalgamation of two former slides, so it's useful for your revision. In addition to this, there's a self-stimulation and reward pathway, very similar to the pathway we saw with the mesolimbic system in previous lectures. A good example here is a rat learning to press a button in order to get food. The food here is the reward. As the rat learns that you push a button and you receive food, it will repeatedly push that button to get food when it's hungry. A variety of self-stimulation sites exist in the brain. Here, if we're looking at a rat brain, see the cerebellum at the back, you have the dorsal pons and the ventral pons shown, the medial forebrain. The lateral hypothalamus and the septal area are shown as well on here. 
All of these sites probably access the Mesolimbic nucleus accumbens pathway, exactly the same as the dopamine system that we had before, where we're finding various drugs such as cocaine, heroin and nicotine also stimulate these pathways. The release of dopamine gives happy feelings and positive thoughts. That's one of the reasons why we have this self-stimulation pathway. A good example is to think of chocolate and why people tend to prefer to eat chocolate over, for example, an apple. If they want to feel better, they want to cheer themselves up. It's because in doing so, you're triggering this self-stimulation reward pathway. So you're starting to feel happy again by eating chocolate rather than eating an apple. Now for something slightly different. I want you to try and think about emotions for a moment. So this is the limbic system. The limbic system is pretty much the basic human brain. So it deals with things such as fear and emotions. Its purpose is survival instinct. So the limbic system is composed of the diencephalon structures and other surrounding deep cortical regions. It includes thalamus, so the gateway to the cortex, the hypothalamus, hippocampus and the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that is key in the detection of fear, and sensation of fear. So I want you to think for a moment whether emotions cause a physiological response or whether it's the other way around. So in the example shown, you have a sensory stimulus. A stimulus is perceived through the visual system or it could be perceived through your hearing. The Cannon-Bard theory dictates that the emotion experience is fear, is detected first. That then results in an emotional expression on the face. So somatic and visceral responses, increased heart rate, increased breathing, sweating, anxiety. However, the James Lang theory suggests that the stimulus is perceived and that directly triggers that emotional expression. So the somatic and visceral response, which then feeds back into the brain to deal with the emotional experience, i.e. the feeling of fear. We don't know which of these two theories is correct. If you take a slice through the brain so you can identify various sections of the limbic system, the amygdala is shown either side of the neocortex, either side of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is directly below the thalamus, which is directly below the lateral ventricle. The hippocampus itself effectively comes round the side, so if you look at the side slice, the medial view, you'll be able to see where it is. The hippocampus lies pretty much underneath the main structures of the ventricles, the amygdala lies either side of two centres, either side of the pituitary gland. If you take the amygdala and look at it in more detail, you have cortical medial nuclei at the top, a central nucleus to the side, and basolateral nuclei take over the majority of this area of the brain. The amygdala deals with our perception of fear and receives sensory information directly. It's also involved in our learning responses to stimuli that we associate with pain. So if you have had a painful experience in the past, if faced with repeating that experience, you will feel fear and anxiety. It initiates our stress and escape responses. So it's involved in identifying where exits may lie and identifying threats. It's also involved in recognising fear in others. So although humans, generally speaking, have different things to fear than, say, other animals, a classic example is in a forest fire, all animals will detect and smell smoke detect it and leave very quickly. Even an animal who's just come into that forest, and that could be a human coming in, will recognise the fear response in the other animals. And that will actually trigger feelings of anxiety and fear in yourself, even though you may not yet be able to identify the fire or smell any smoke. Moving from the amygdala and onto the hippocampus. The hippocampus is pretty much directly behind where the amygdala is. So if you take a lateral view, you'll find that the hippocampus is located in the temporal lobes. On the lateral slice, you can see the lateral ventricle coming down. The hippocampus itself is twisted round. The thalamus is either side, the top, and then you have the lateral ventricle directly above the thalamus. The hippocampus receives sensory input from the local cortex, and the output returns to the cortex. We believe that the hippocampus is associated with short-term memory, although the actual mechanisms of how we learn and develop memory, both short and long term, are currently unknown. In summary, from this lecture you need to understand the structure and function of the main areas of the cortex and forebrain, 
And you need to understand the visual, auditory, language and feeding system pathways that we've discussed. If you need any further help, as always, please contact me. My email address is the easiest way of getting hold of me. Or alternatively, have a look in the recommended textbook, which is Principles of Anatomy and Physiology, 12th edition, by Tortora and Derrickson.